Welcome back. If you are planning on passing the CPC exam, you know that practice makes perfect. So today we're going to be getting in some practice. We're going to go through 10 CPC exam prep questions. Hey there, I'm Victoria. I'm a medical coder, auditor, educator, and content creator. And on my channel, I provide tips, tricks, and tutorials to help you be successful in a medical coding career. Today, we're going to go over step-by-step -step 10 mock CPC exam questions. They are multiple choice. And you might be thinking to yourself, Victoria, are these actual questions from the exam? No. Number one, that would be unethical if I was sharing with you exact questions from the exam. Second, I don't believe in the philosophy of sharing exam questions because the exam bank is hundreds, if not, I believe probably more like at least a thousand, if not thousands of questions that they pull randomly for the electronic CPC exams. So even if you had a list of likely questions, there is only a fraction of a chance that those exact questions will appear on your CPC exam. So it is very critical to learn more so concepts and exam strategies versus memorization of test questions. So in a moment, I'm going to go through question one, and I do want to remind you that you can change the speed of this video as well as pause. So if I am going too fast or too slow for you, you can change the speed of the video to accommodate your personal preference. And while I provide these videos for free, I would certainly appreciate a like or a subscribe as payment. So let's get into our first case study question. I have got my CPT book all at the ready because that is going to be our first question is going to be based off of CPT. Now my book is tabbed. You are allowed to for the CPC exam or any AAPC exams tab your books. They don't have to be as wonderful and coordinated as these, but you cannot use post-it notes with supplementary information as tabs. They have to just be clearly there to just mark your pages. So question one is during an endoscopic examination, a patient is found to have a laceration in the pharynx caused by accidental trauma from a foreign object. The physician performs exploration, which removes debris and sutures the wound to repair the injury. Which of the following CPT codes would be used? We have option A, 30100, B, 42826, C, 42900, and D, 43220. Now, if we look in these answers, I always say to kind of look at the answers first to make sure that you're in the right area, checking the right section, that you're not all over the place, that you're not trying to look for an ICD-10 CM code, right? We want to look at at the question itself, which is regarding CPT. We are looking for CPT codes and we kind of want to look at these and determine like, are these close enough together that maybe we just want to turn to the page that these are on for the purposes of the exam and determine what is the appropriate CPT code out of there? Or do we want to start in our index? So for these, some of them are further apart. We have a 30,000 code. The rest are 42,000, 42,000, 43,000. So it might not make sense to go right to looking up the codes. That is a strategy you can use if you want to just look up 30100 and go, oh, is that right? Is this one right? Is this one right? Is this one right? But for this one, let's actually start in the index. With CPT, you are absolutely not required to start in the index. It does not have the same lookup guidelines that ICD-10-CM does where alphabet, you have to start in the alphabetic index. With CPT, you can do more of a search and find. So with this one, we're going to kind of figure out what term to look for and what are they doing. They are doing a suture. It says they suture the wound to repair the injury. I'm going to look up the term suture. I think that's where I want to start. Although sometimes in medical coding, there can be more than one way to skin a cat. So if you start with something else, but come up to the same answer, hey, there's no right or wrong way then. So what are they suturing? If we go back here, we can see it's a laceration of the pharynx. So let's see if we have something for suture of pharynx. All right. And right there it is. We go to suture and over here we have pharynx. And we are very lucky in this case, there is only one selection here, which is pharynx wound. So depending on your speed philosophy on if you want to double check things, you could, for the purposes of the exam, establish that you want to take that kind of a risk and just say, hey, clearly this is 42900. But if you feel more comfortable looking it up, you can. Again, this is just for exam purposes. When we are coding in the real world, we always double check. But if you're like, hey, I'm more concerned about conserving time for the exam. And then maybe if I have time at the end, I'll go back and look over things. That is a perfectly fine exam strategy. So if we go in here, 42900, suture pharynx for wound or injury, that is exactly what we did here. 
So in this case, the answer would be our C, the 42900. Next question, we have a 35-year-old patient who received a bone marrow transplant as part of treatment for leukemia. They present with fever, fatigue, and a blood test indicating an immune response against the transplanted marrow. The physician concludes there's a rejection of the bone marrow transplant. Which of the following ICD-10 CM codes should be used to document this diagnosis? We have T86.00, T86.01, T86.02, and T86.03. So here's one where we're like, hey, um, I think I might just be looking these codes up because look, they're right next to each other. We don't have to worry about possibly even flipping pages with these. And again, we're looking for an ICD-10 CM code. And there is a rejection of the bone marrow transplant. That's what we're coding. We're not coding for this leukemia, fever, fatigue, blood test, blah, blah, blah. There is a rejection of the bone marrow transplant. That diagnosis is what we're trying to document and code for. So which is the ICD-10-CM code for rejection of bone marrow transplant? So we have to put our CPT book aside and we have to get out our ICD-10-CM. So oh, here is my beautiful tabbed ICD-10-CM book, and we are looking up the T86 codes. All right, so these codes are way down here in the bottom of the book. Okay, so we have complications of bone marrow transplant. We have unspecified rejection, failure, infection, or other. Now, what did this documentation say? It says we are coding for a rejection. So if we look at that there in our ICD-10-CM book, that means that we are coding for 0 0.01. Now, this is also the part of the video where I would like to also mention that the purpose of me sharing my books is so that you can follow along with your own books, not that so that you can see every single detail of everything that's going on in the book. Just the watching of this video in and of itself is not going to help you with the CPC exam. You really need to follow along and understand the concepts, the lookup process, and what the exam looks like. When I organized these case studies, I did, as I created <laughs> these scratch questions, um, I did attempt to format them more like the online exam looks now. They're split more in half, but I wanted to, since I'm going to be sharing some things on lookup and also myself, uh, split it not quite in half and give more focus on the questions since they're a little bit longer and then have the answers on the side. But you will have a split screen on the exam as well that's going to have like questions over here and then the on answers over here. And there are lots of functions on how to move around and skip. You do have to be comfortable with using the exam. I think some of them are like in the top left hand corner and the icons aren't, aren't marked. So it's not going to say, hey, if you want to skip this question, click this button here. You have have to determine that level of comfort to go, hey, I'm going to see what this button does and then click and see if that's the one that will move you around or what have you. You have people say sometimes like I didn't have the capacity to bring up notes or whatever in my exam. It is there. It's just that you might not be aware of where it is because it's not going to be a big button that says click here to open up uh, where you can write some notes. So when we look at this next question, this is an anesthesia question. So now we're flopping back to our CPT book. 48-year-old patient requires surgery for a ruptured Achilles tendon, which will be repaired with a graft. The anesthesiologist, the anesthesiologist is preparing to administer anesthesia specifically for this procedure. Which of the following anesthesia CBT codes is most appropriate for this surgery? Anesthesia isn't a huge section of CPT, so this might be one where you just decide to look in your anesthesia section. So anesthesia, and we have 01400 is our first one. So here's 400, 472. So it's not too far apart, 522 and 01630. So let's see here. I'm going to kind of look through these and just kind of see if I can eliminate as I go down A through D. So our first option would be 01400, anesthesia for open or surgical arthroscopic procedures of knee joint. I don't know how I feel about that for Achilles tendon. No, no, no. Um, next we have 472, which is anesthesia. Oh, we got to get our full description in here. Anesthesia for procedures on nerves, muscles, tendons. And it does say the Achilles tendon and fascia of lower leg, ankle, and foot, 
And then the rest of our description for 472 would be repair a ruptured Achilles tendon with or without graft. And this says it was repaired with a graft. So, but we, it would be the same code if it had a graft or did not have a graft because it says with or without graft. 01472 is definitely sounding like the right answer. Let's take a quick look at the others and see if they look like maybe even they'd be possible answers. Uh, this one says here venous thrombectomy. We didn't do anything like that. No, we, we weren't doing vein procedures. 630 is diagnostic. And this definitely was not a diagnostic procedure. So for this one, it's going to be our option C, which is our 01472. Okay, so this one, you're going to get some questions that are just med term, anatomy, maybe even some physiology. So how do we tackle these? Like what resources can we use that we have Within our books, because that's all we're allowed to have, we cannot bring a medical dictionary to the CPC exam. Like, how do we determine these questions if we don't know this off the top of our head? So this question is asking, what is the name of the thin membrane that lines the chambers of the heart and valves? Is it myocardium, pericardium, epicardium, or endocardium? Now, some people's strategy in regards to this is to just write all of the med term that they possibly can in the notes section of their books. That makes it a little bit hard to find. I would say if you're going to write some med term type notes to yourself, do them near your anatomical illustrations. For example, if you want to write the blood flow of the heart, do it near the illustration of where the heart is. But for this question, we're talking about the name of the thin membrane that lines the chambers of the heart and valves. So here is our heart wall. So here we can see from our illustration, we have here the epicardium on the outside, our pericardium. And then we have this thick line of myocardium. And then there is that, what they refer to in this question as the thin membrane that lines the chambers of the heart wall right there. That is our endocardium. If you want to write specific definitions that you saw during your studies, you can definitely do that. I think near the illustrations, I think that's just an easy place to remember where they all are. So for this one, the answer is D, the endocardium. All right, next we're going to be doing one that looks like it is ICD-10-CM and CPT. This is a skin question. Sorry, you know they're my favorite. Question five, patient receives a diagnosis of actinic keratosis affecting her chest and arms. She visits her doctor's office to have these lesions treated. Using cryosurgery, the doctor removes four lesions from the right arm, four from the left forearm, and four from the chest. What CPT and ICD-10-CM codes should be used for these procedures? So again, we're looking for CPT and ICD-10-CM. As a reminder, you do not have the capacity to highlight or underline within your exam. What you can do, though, is bring up a little notes box. You can detach it. It looks like it's embedded in there, but there is a little button that's on the box that will pop it up so you can kind of move it around as you need to on your screen. So as you're taking your exam, if you want to open up your notes box and kind of make yourself some notes, it'll pop up and you can type things in to kind of keep track of what you're looking up or maybe what you're excluding doing there. Now, if I got this question on the exam and I was tackling it, I would start right there at 17000. It looks like 17003 is maybe an add-on code, right? You can kind of determine that. And we're trying to figure out how many lesions we're taking off and what the codes are for those lesions. Now with lesions, some of them are by location, some of them are by depth and size and all kinds of things. So this one, it looks like we're removing using cryosurgery, their actinic keratoses, which are a pre-malignant lesion. And we have four from the arm, four from the forearm, and then four from the chest. So four and four is eight plus another four is 12. Right away, I'm thinking B is probably not correct because that's a 19 of something. So I'm just going to, I'm not even going to worry about that one. Um, this one's kind of funny with the three and then the four. And then this one has 11. So it could be because this maybe is the first one. And then there's 11 added on. This one is just a one zero zero with three. So let, let's take a look at this. C and D have the same diagnosis. So I'm actually going to start over here in my CPG book. So here we go. I'm going to zoom you guys in. So here's these 170 and then 17003 codes. It is an add-on. And let's go in real close. So this was for 14 lesions. They're in different locations. But if we look at this, 
what does this tell us? It says actinic keratosis, right? And that's what we have. Uh, these were removed during cryosurgery. And that's what it says here. It includes cryosurgery. So destruction, cryosurgery, actinic keratosis, match, match, match. And then we look here and we have first lesion. So the first lesion, 17000, that's for our first lesion. How many lesions did we take off? Now, since we're not separating out by location, we're just going to use this same code. So 17000, we took off 12. And then 17003 is our second through 14 lesions each. And that each is a very key term in this. And people get very confused about this. So list separately in addition to a code for first lesion. So here's our first code. And then here's our add-on code. And how many times are we going to add this on? Well, we're actually going to add it on 11 times because this is for second through 14th each. It's not through 2 through 14 lesions. It's for each lesion from 2 through 14. The only time we would not bill that is 17004 is when we're doing 15 or more. So if we're doing 18, 17, 105, we would bill just 17004. But if we're billing from that sweet spot where we're doing somewhere between that 1 and 14, we're going to use 17000 for the first one. And then for each one after, we're going to add on this add-on code up to 14. So when we go back to our case study here, we had how many total? We had four and four and four, which totals 12. So we have our first code is the 17000. That's for our first one of the 12. We have 11 more to go. So we would use the 17003 times 11. Let's look at our answers. Do we have any that are 17003 times 11? Yes, we do. We only have one. So in this case, we don't even really need to confirm our ICD-10-CM codes because we can tell just based off of the CPT that our answer is D, 17000, 17003 times 11, and then the L57.0 for the actinic keratosis. All right, now back to CPT coding questions. A patient with ovarian cancer undergoes surgery. The physician performs a total abdominal hysterectomy, bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy, and total omentectomy, meticulously removing all visible metastatic disease. The procedure involves exposing the anterior uterine surface through an abdominal incision, dissecting the bladder off the uterus, and removing the uterus, cervix, ovaries, tubes, and omentum after ensuring no adherence to the rectum. What is the CPT code reported for the surgical service? So again, let's take a look at what are we looking for here? We're looking for a CPT code for a surgical service. What is the surgical service? It is a total abdominal hysterectomy, bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy, and total omentectomy. And key thing here is it is an abdominal hysterectomy. Now we have a few things here that are kind of all over the place. We have 58150, that seems to appear a couple of times. We have a 58956, we have a 58700 that's appeared a couple of times. The 49255 appears a couple of times. And then we have, yeah, so it's it looks like a mix of all the same codes. What I think this question though is trying to test us on is maybe are we billing separately for the hysterectomy and then another code for the oophorectomy and then another code for the omentectomy? It, are we billing out for dissection separately uh, or is there a comprehensive code? I think that's what this question is really trying to test us on from a concept perspective. Since this one's pretty intensive, I'm actually going to start in our index with our hysterectomy codes. Okay, so we have a lot of stuff going on here. We did a hysterectomy, salpingo-oophorectomy, and omentectomy. So here we have hysterectomy, abdominal, and then we have total, total meaning we removed everything, the tubes, the ovaries, with omentectomy, 58956. So 58596, bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy with total omentectomy, total abdominal hysterectomy for malignancy. Now this did say in here that the patient was seen for cancer, and this appears to cover all of our bases. It was abdominal hysterectomy, 
bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy, and total omentectomy. If we were to look up some of these other codes, it would basically be piecemealed different information. It would be one code for hysterectomy and one for the removal of the ovaries, etc. So when we look at this whole scene, we can see that this is just one comprehensive code. 58956. So that's really what this question was kind of trying to quiz us on is do we know how to find the most comprehensive code that includes everything versus unbundling all of these procedures and billing them separately, which we're not supposed to do. Now for this question, it states a surgeon performed an excision of a neoplasm from the lacrimal gland. So not a skin neoplasm. This is from the lacrimal gland through a frontal approach in a 45-year-old patient, ensuring clean margins with the aid of separately reportable frozen sections evaluated by pathology, what are the appropriate CPT and ICD-10-CM codes to use for this procedure? Now, the ICD-10-CM codes are kind of all over the place. We have four different types of codes. We have a C code, a couple of D codes. They don't look super close. I mean, I would start this more so with, I think, the CPT section versus ICD-10-CM, and I already have my CPT book out, so it just, I think, makes more sense at this stage to look up the CPT, and then, you know, if we need to val validate the ICD-10-CM codes, we will. So what are we doing here? We're doing an excision of a neoplasm from the lacrimal gland, frontal approach, and we have a couple options here, 68510, 68530, 68520, 685. Four zero. Wow, those are pretty close together. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to the page where those codes are. Hey, look at that. It's a bunch of codes, lacrimal system. Some of them say incision, it looks like, and then we're getting to excision. So we're looking for an excision code, and we're looking for an excision of a neoplasm from the lacrimal gland, not a complete removal of the lacrimal gland, an excision of a neoplasm through frontal approach. So our options that we have are basically 510, 2030, or 40. We didn't do a biopsy. We didn't excise the sac. We excised a lesion. We have here removal of a foreign body. I don't think that's what we did. Um, an excision of a lacrimal gland tumor frontal approach. That sounds more akin to what we did. And it, we, we can even confirm here it was the frontal approach. That was right there in the description of the question. So in this case, do we need to look up the ICD-10-CM codes? No. If you are paranoid and you want to invest that extra dime in it just to make sure 100% that you're right, uh, you absolutely can do that. But considering this isn't a... Um, we don't have a pathology report on this one, so it's probably an unspecified code. What do we know about unspecified codes? A lot of them I'm saying end in that nine, right? Like a D49.89, right? Mm -hmm. So that alone might help tip us off that this is the correct answer and that it is our option D, which is our 68540 and D49.89. Next, we have one that is kind of structured a little bit similar, right? 55-year-old patient undergoing treatment for breast cancer receives external beam radiation therapy targeted to a single area with the utilization of two simple blocks and an energy level of 6 MEV. What CPT code best represents the service? So another CPT question. Again, the, the CPC exam is, I think, like 80% CPT questions. And if we look here, we can see that they're kind of grouped close together again, 77402, 407, 412, and then 371. So again, I'm just going to flip to right around where all these answers are. So we have... 402, 407, 412, and then that 371 is over here. So we can look at just this open page right here and see all these answers. But which one is the right answer? So we have 402, and what are we looking for here? We're looking for, well, let's see, what do we think? We have two simple blocks. Um, we have level six of MEV. I'm not even sure what that is, but I feel like that looks like something important. So those are kind of the things I'm going to focus on when we're looking at these potential answers. So 402, radiation treatment delivery, greater than or equal to one MEV, simple. Now, this one, the, now the question said two simple blocks, energy level of six MEV. That's definitely greater than one. This one says intermediate. This says simple. The other one said simple. Our question, our question said simple. It didn't say intermediate. Nothing intermediate. Nothing that 
feels like it's intermediate or complex. And then if we want to confirm our definitions, they're over here in CPT. So simple is all of our creating, um, let's see, one or two ports and two or fewer simple blocks. And that's what we had. We had two simple blocks. So I think that's pretty much confirming for us that this 402 code is really what we're looking for. We can look 77371 if you want to. We'll just take a quick look over there. 371, radiation treatment doesn't even say anything about those MEVs. Sorry, I know that's a little out of focus, but we're not spending too much time on that. So in this case, our answer is going to be 77402. We've got another hystero question in here. And this one's for a hysteroscopy, it looks like, during a scheduled outpatient hysteroscopy procedure intended for the removal of fibroids, the surgeon decides not to remove a small fibroid deemed too risky to extract due to its proximity to the uterine wall. The procedure is otherwise compl completed without complications. What CPT code is reported for the surgical service? Oh, okay, so this is interesting because if we look here, look, we have two options without a 52 modifier and we have two options with the 52 modifier. What is our 52 modifier? Well, we have two places to look this up. One is in the inter front flap of our book. So 52, reduced service. And then what does that mean? Our full modifier definitions are in our appendix A. So if we look, reduced service basically means we partially reduced or eliminated that procedure at the discretion of the physician or other qualified healthcare professional, which to me sounds like it's what we did here. So is it going to be a 58558 with the 52 or a 58555 with the 52? Again, when it comes to the exam, it's all about saving time. We're not going to do this in real world coding at our jobs because we're, we're not going to be offered multiple choice options. So 58555 is a hysteroscopy that's just diagnostic, and that's a separate procedure. This is our 558 hysteroscopy surgical with sampling of endometrium and polypectomy with or without DNC. So in this case, we were planning to remove fibroids, which were on the endometrial wall, but we determined it was too risky and opted not to which means that it would be more akin to a 58558. So in that case, our option would be our B, 58558 with the 52 modifier. Last question here, we're getting into evaluation and management, everyone's favorite. An established patient with a history of type 2 diabetes and hypertension returns for a follow-up visit. The patient has been managing their diabetes with metformin and their hypertension with lisinopril, but reports recent changes, challenges in the controlling their blood sugar and blood pressure levels during the exam provider reviews the patient's comprehensive medical history, assesses their current condition through a detailed examination, and decides to increase the dosage of metformin and amlodipin to better control the hypertension. What CPT code best represents this service? So we're determining, is this an established patient level two, three, four, or five? Oftentimes, most of these are threes or fours, uh, statistically speaking, but for the exam, they could be anything. So I don't think this is a level five. Where do we kind of go, though, to kind of get some definitions on our E&M stuff? Now, it used to be for the exam, they would just give you the level of history exam medical decision making because that's what we used to score them on. And you could just pick it out of that. But now they're not so much spoon feeding it to you. So, for example, if we go to our definition of our level four, it tells us it's an office or other outpatient visit for the evaluation and management of an established patient, which requires a medically appropriate exam or history and moderate level of decision making. So how do we determine if this is moderate level decision making? Well, for the exam, sometimes they will embed things like E&M calculators. I can't, I can't confirm that they do for the CPC exam. So let's just look at what we have available in our book. So here is the information in the book about leveling E&M services. Now, I'm not going to give you an entire overview of how to level an E&M service because that should have been learned during your training. I'm just going through now how to use that knowledge during the exam and use the resources that you have available during the exam. So if we look here, these are our levels of medical decision making. Straightforward, low, moderate, and high is on the other page. I don't know why they didn't just put them like they do on the grid and just have you turn your book, whatever. This is what we've got. 
So we need to figure out, based off of the information that was given in this question, um, what level we're going to bill. So how many chronic conditions did this patient have? What kind of uh, risk are we doing? Were we doing... I, I like to always kind of default to a level four. And then if it meets a level four, great, which is moderate. Um, and if not, I'll go, okay, if it didn't meet the level four, um, then we're going to have to go down to three. Did it meet a level three? And then go down from there. Um, or if it met the level four, go, okay, great. Did they only meet a level four? Or did we maybe do more than that and we could maybe meet a level five. So in this case, this is a patient, they have type two diabetes, they have hypertension, and we're changing some medications. So we've met uh, two or, it's about not two or more self-limited or minor problems. We have more than one stable chronic illness. We're actually, these aren't really stable. They're not at goal, right? Um, they're not acute uncomplicated injuries, not an acute illness not an uncomplicated illness or injury. Okay. So we have, if we go down here, we can see two or more stable chronic illnesses. Well, it was at least that. I wouldn't say that they were maybe stable, um, but we at the very least met this, right? And over here is our prescription drug management, which we did manage the drugs. We actually changed it and added a drug. So at the very least, we met moderate. Let's go over and see if we met anything from the high category. So we don't have chronic illnesses with severe exacerbations. Um, we did not have a life to threat or life to bodily function. Um, we didn't really go over a lot of tests, studies. We didn't talk to other providers in this case. So not really a lot of complexity of data. Um, we're not doing intensive monitoring with drug therapy. We're not doing parental control substances. We're not <laughs> contemplating major surgery. Um, so it doesn't look like we really met the high level, but I do feel pretty comfortable that we met that moderate level. There's also some grids in the front of your book you can use if you find those helpful too. So for here, officer, outpatient, and we had established moderate is our 99214. So that's going to be our option C, which is our 99214. So those are 10 questions similar to the ones that you may see on the CPC exam. I hope you found this helpful. If you would like me to cover any other sort of specific questions on future videos, definitely let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. I will see you guys in the next video. And until then, just keep on coding on and good luck on your exam.